Hello, I'm Philip Kemp and I'm going to be talking about uh, Masaki Kobayashi's great trilogy, The Human Condition, one of the longest and most impressive films, in my opinion, ever made. Kobayashi was a member of that wartime, post-war generation of Japanese directors that included Akira Kurosawa, Konichikawa and Keisuke Kinoshita. He was about the same age as all of them, but as we'll see, for various reasons, his filmmaking career didn't start until about 10 years later than the others. And compared to his colleagues, he directed relatively few films, only about 20 in all. Compare that with Ichikawa, who made well over 80, including a load of television. Kobayashi, for some reason, didn't much like television, made very little of it, and when he did make some, refused to watch it. He was born in February 1916 in the port city of Otaru on the Japanese island of Hokkaido, the northernmost of the main Japanese islands. His family wasn't particularly artistic, although a slightly older cousin was the actress Kinyu Tanaka, who is probably the finest film actress that Japan has ever produced. However, what was unusual about his family, at least for that time, was that they were very unauthoritarian in their attitude to their children. Kobayashi and his siblings, he had two older brothers and one younger sister, were encouraged to speak their own minds, to express opinions, to question, and generally behave in ways which for the majority of uh, Japanese families at the time would have probably seemed hopelessly undisciplined. This no doubt led to Kobayashi's own anti-authoritarian attitudes later in life. Another thing he remembered from his childhood is that he loved to climb up the hills overlooking the town and look down across the roofs to the port. And he later, possibly not totally seriously, uh, suggested this might be one reason why he always loved to take overhead shots in his films. He studied at uh, Waseda University in Tokyo, where he particularly studied philosophy and oriental art. He loved oriental art, in fact he loved all art, and he seriously considered becoming a painter. But of course, war had by then broken out and he knew he would probably very soon be called up and quite possibly would not survive. Decided that a subject as long established as painting would be very difficult to make his mark in in a short time, whereas a younger art like cinema, he might at least have the chance of achieving something before he died. He therefore joined Shochiko Studios in Tokyo. But he was absolutely right in his fears Barely eight months later, he was called up and joined the Japanese Imperial Army and was sent to Japanese-occupied Manchuria. He didn't return to Shichiko until 1946 and we'll come back shortly to his uh, wartime experiences since they're highly relevant to this film. Once back at Shichiko, he became directorial assistant to Keisuke Kinoshita, who, despite only being four years older than him, had quite a lot of experience under his belt by now. Kinoshita, like Ichikawa and Kurosawa, had managed to uh, escape the call-up. Kinoshita was apparently a demanding but very supportive uh, employer, and... Kobayashi always paid tribute to Kinoshita's help and encouragement in becoming a director himself. He worked on about half a dozen of Kinoshita's films and often contributed to the scripts and in fact received script credit on one or two of them. He directed his own first film, My Son's Youth, in 1952. This wasn't really characteristic of Kobayashi's mature work. It felt, in fact, more like a Kinoshita film, a sentimental domestic drama, as was his second film, Sincerity, that he made a year later in 53. And uh, Kinoshita, in fact, uh, scripted Sincerity 
almost as a tribute to his former assistant. The breakthrough came with Kobayashi's third film, The Thick Walled Room, which dared to take on the then taboo subject of Japanese war criminals. Even worse from the point of view of Shuchiko's top brass, not only did it talk about Japanese war criminals, but strongly suggested that those who had been tried and sentenced were very much the lowest echelons and had mostly been obeying orders and had very little choice in so doing. Whereas those who had issued the orders, the real war criminals, as Kobayashi saw it, were let off scot-free and in many cases continued to hold powerful high ranks within the post-war Japanese government. This, as you can imagine, was not something that Shuchiko were very pleased about hearing, and the film was suppressed for three years, and Kobayashi prudently went back to making the uh, fairly innocuous Kinoshita-type comedies that he had started out with. He made three more of them and then uh, made another break for freedom with a film called I'll Buy You, at least that's the way the title is normally uh, translated, which was a study of corruption in the world of professional baseball and then followed up with an even more hard-hitting film, Black River, which exposed the rings of corruption, crime and prostitution surrounding the American bases in Japan. This again was not something that Shuchiko were very uh, happy about, but by this time Kobayashi was a talented and established enough director that they released it. So by now it was fairly evident that Kobayashi's preoccupations were with what he saw as the pervasive moral corruption that had entered Japan with its militaristic government in the early 30s and to his thinking were still powerful forces within post-war Japan. And then in the latter half of the 1950s a writer called Junpei Gomikawa published a huge six-volume novel Ningen no Jokun, The Human Condition. It was strongly autobiographical and closely based on Gomikawa's own experiences as a wartime conscript in the Japanese army. Kobayashi immediately recognised the echo of his own wartime experiences. Like him, Gomikawa had been posted to occupied Manchuria and rapidly snapped up the movie rights. Well before reading this novel, he later observed, I was sure that I would deal with this subject from my own personal experience because I was still full of anger about militarism and about the five years I spent in the army and the prisoner of war camps. Like Gomikawa and like Kaji, Gomikawa's protagonist in the novel, Kobayashi was a reluctant conscript, totally out of sympathy with Japan's war aims and found himself in constant conflict with the brutal ethos of the Japanese Imperial Army 
He refused to rise above the rank of privates, despite the fact that he was considered potential officer material. I withheld myself from becoming an officer, he later recalled. I had a strong conviction that I must resist authoritarian pressure. I was wholly against the power that bore down on us, and I was against the war itself. Like Kaji, having been sent to occupied Manchuria, at the end of the war he was captured and interned in a prisoner of war camp. In his case, though, he was held in Okinawa by the Americans and released after a year, rather than being captured as was Kaji in the novel by the Russians, which was a rather more traumatic experience. Shochiko were very unenthused about the project altogether. It was only when Kobayashi threatened to quit the studio that they relented. Even then, a full decade and more after the war, there was still widespread opposition to any criticism of Japan's wartime regime, as indeed in some quarters there still is today. And once the film was made, Kobayashi was attacked as anti-Japanese by some of his compatriots. The Human Condition, at roughly nine and a half hours, probably one of the longest films ever made, took four years to make. To play the lead, Kaji, who's on screen for probably at least 90% of the action, Kobayashi took quite a gamble. He cast the 27-year-old Tatsuya Nakadai. Kobayashi himself had discovered Nakadai some four or five years earlier, working as a Tokyo shop assistant, and gave him his first role in the thick-walled room, and then later cast him in Black River. Nakadai had subsequently worked with other directors, including Kurosawa and Ichikawa, but had never before played a lead. The gamble paid off. Nakadai was nervous about such a challenging role. Kaji, he said, seemed like entirely the wrong role for me, but in the end gave a performance of burning conviction. He would go on to a stellar career, playing the lead in what, for many people, is Kobayashi's finest film, Seppuku, otherwise known as Harakiri, as well as playing Toshiro Mifune's nemesis in Kurosawa's Yojimbo and Sanjuro, and much later, after... Kurosawa and Mifune had unfortunately fallen out, was Kurosawa's choice to play the lead in the director's two late masterpieces, Kagamusha and Ran. Despite apparent rivalry between them, Nakadai and Mifune were very good friends, and there was no enmity between them. The Human Condition was released in three parts. The titles given to the three parts were No Greater Love, Road to Eternity, and A Soldier's Prayer. But it makes sense, I think, to consider it as a continuous whole. Barring the occasional brief flashback, usually only a verbal flashback at that, the treatment is linear and traces the gradual moral degradation of Kaji, the hero, the embodiment of the conflicted Japanese conscience. In the first part, he's capable of suffering lasting remorse over having slapped a man once in the face. By the third part, as a prisoner of war, he's capable of beating a fellow prisoner to death with a chain, even if with a certain amount of justification. This is the central theme of almost all Kobayashi's mature work, the dilemma of the principal dissident. How can someone who rejects the basic tenets of an unjust society remain with it and yet avoid being tainted and ultimately even corrupted by it? Kaji, like Kobayashi himself and like, of course, Gomikawa, holds left-wing humanist views. An idealist, he believes in the Soviet Union as a better world beyond the border where men are treated like human beings. When we first meet him, he's working for a Japanese-run steel company in Manchuria. He's engaged to a fellow employee called Michiko, but is reluctant to marry her or even sleep with her, as he fears he may be called up at any moment. So when his boss offers him a job as head of personnel at the company's mining camp, he accepts it, even though he knows it involves supervising forced Chinese labour, since it grants him exemption from military service. This crucial moral compromise, accepting a role in the oppressive system to avoid a worse fate for himself, is Kaji's first step on his downward path. Some critics have accused Kobayashi of loading the dice by making Kaji saintly, even some have said 
Christ-like. I can't see that at all. Although he's certainly principled and very well-meaning, right from the start we have shown his disregard for the feelings of others in the way he behaves towards Michiko. When he first arrives at the mine, it's evident that for all his good intentions, he's culpably naive and arrogant, denouncing his colleagues and believing he can single-handedly introduce more humane treatment of the Chinese workers. Inevitably, this earns him the enmity of the supervisors and foremen, and the contempt of the bland, cynical mine boss, who, when Kaji protests that the Chinese deserve to be treated like men, retorts, what is a man, a mass of lust and greed that absorbs and ex excretes? To his despair, Kaji finds himself inextricably implicated in the system he detests. His nationality is enough to condemn him. To the Chinese, he's suspect as a member of the oppressor race, a Japanese devil. To his compatriots, he's an enemy sympathiser and a filthy red. Throughout the trilogy, this pattern is repeated. Kaji, becoming an increasingly isolated figure, finds his best intentions backfiring on him. His attempt to prevent the execution of seven Chinese prisoners incurs the enmity of the feared and loathed Kenpei Tai, the military police. For having made them lose face, he's savagely beaten, and then, when he's released, finds his draft exemption has been revoked. Once in the army, his resistance to the brutal, bullying culture he finds there has little effect on the system. But, ironically, his obstinacy and evident courage mark him out to his superiors as a good soldier. Kobayashi himself, apparently, despite like Kaji loathing the army, proved to be a crack shot. But the film's bitterest irony hits home in part three. Having maintained his starry-eyed belief in the integrity of the Soviet system, Kaji, the left-leaning, filthy red, winds up interred in a Soviet prisoner of war camp where he expects to be treated with justice and humanity. Instead, trapped in a system as tyrannical as that of Japan, where the most corrupt and brutal inmates are given power over their fellow prisoners, he finds himself enslaved and reviled as a war criminal and a fascist samurai. And when, finally managing to escape, he attempts to trek back to his beloved Michiko. The Chinese peasantry see in him only the despised and hated former occupier and refuse him food. Repeatedly, Kobayashi emphasises Kaji's psychological isolation and the hopelessness of his moral stance by isolating him in expanses of bleak, sterile terrain. The ravaged mining landscape, the battlefield, the final pitiless snowscape, that exploit Yoshio Miyajima's monochrome widescreen photography to powerful effect. But he also finds room for unexpected moments of lyrical beauty. Writing in Positif, the critic Hubert Niogre called Kobayashi one of the consciences of the century. The human condition stands as an achievement of extraordinary power and emotional resonance at once a celebration of the resilience of the individual conscience and a purging of that forced complicity and guilt of a nation and, as the title implies, of the whole human race that Kaji attains through his tragic fate and Kobayashi through the making of this film. Although the trilogy aroused widespread controversy in Japan, it was critically acclaimed, won numerous international awards and lastingly established Kobayashi's reputation among the leading Japanese directors of his generation. Joan Mellon, who's written extensively about Japanese cinema, calls The Human Condition one of the most brilliant historical films ever made. Personally, I wouldn't disagree. <laughs>